New COVID variants aren't only making the virus more transmissible, they're upending efforts to control infection rates. This month, South Africa cancelled plans to give people the AstraZeneca jab after finding it wasn't effective enough against the local variant. Uh, it was definitely disappointing uh, hearing the much lower than expected efficacy of the AstraZeneca vaccine. Time is ticking. No one knows when and how new variants will affect transmission and whether the current vaccines will work. The UK is stepping up testing to stop virus variants from spreading. Up to 10% of positive tests are sent to labs for further genome analysis. In the global fight against COVID-19, it's mutations that are proving the next great challenge. And here in the UK, authorities are taking that fight directly into people's homes. Guys, let's go. They're doing door-to-door -door COVID testing in areas where new mutations have been found. The goal, to identify cases before they have a chance to spread. It was just one case of the South African variant found here in this community that launched this door-to-door -door testing scheme. But the concern is that one case could just be the tip of the iceberg. Ordinarily, only a small amount of positive COVID tests are screened for mutations, meaning that when they are found, authorities here are cracking down hard. It's thanks to genome sequencing that authorities can pinpoint where to look. The UK is the world leader in sequencing, analysing 10% of positive COVID samples for the emergence of new variants. In total, the team at the UK's COVID-19 Genomics Consortium is responsible for almost half the world's coronavirus sequencing. Work that will continue to prove crucial as more mutations emerge. I don't think we've seen the full spectrum of mutations that could arise. So the variant that's common in England at the moment, the 117, that's very good at spreading. But actually what I'm looking for very carefully is mutations going into that variant that also impact on immunity. And that's what starts to worry me considerably. And that is what we're seeing in, in the UK. But no population is immune to mutations. That's why Professor Peacock says genome sequencing needs to become a global priority. Without comprehensive international screening, it's feared new, more dangerous variants could take hold, putting vaccine programmes at risk. Mutations will be in the four corners of the earth. And there'll be lots that we don't know about that we'd be quite concerned if we did know about. Now, the reason that's important for all of us is because some of these variants are actually going to lead to a challenge in terms of immunisation. Now, that is, is really critical as we go forward. We need to know what the virus is doing so that we can keep up with uh, vaccine development. Work is already being done to modify vaccines to protect against existing variants. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm optimistic. Professor Paul Heath is the chief investigator of the UK's Novavax vaccine trial. He says he's confident sequencing can help manufacturers keep ahead of mutations. One of the beauties of the, the vaccine technologies or platforms that we're seeing now uh, in the production of COVID-19 vaccines is that they are very uh, efficient and flexible. And, and, and so it's entirely possible now that um, modified vaccines will emerge very quickly from the, uh, these different vaccine manufacturers. Vaccines will likely have to adapt. In the meantime, identifying and isolating mutations will be an invaluable tool in the cat and mouse game between vaccines and variants. Julian Tanga is a consultant virologist at the Leicester Royal Infirmary. The new mutations are called variants of concern. How concerned are you? So uh, <clears throat> I'm not that concerned. I think our natural immunity will adapt to these uh, variants. I think most people are concerned because they may be more transmissible. So they may overwhelm the healthcare service for those who need hospitalization. And there's also some uh, vaccine escape properties that some of them are showing that may reduce the efficacy of the current vaccine. But then we just have to update them as we do every year for flu. OK, so no panic yet, but what, what about uh, the various variants? Tell us about the Bristol, Liverpool variant, the, the South African one. 
Yeah, so <clears throat> the original Kent variant, B117, did not have the 484K mutation that seems to be conferring vaccine escape properties. But now the B117 Kent variant has acquired the 484K and it's now called the Bristol variant. But also uh, the previously existing circulating strain from the original Wuhan uh, Chinese variant has now acquired the 484K as well. So the 484K is now kind of infiltrating the UK circulating uh, SARS-CoV-2 viruses. And then, of course, the 484K is already present in the South African variant and the Brazilian variants. Uh, and it seems to be a kind of global adaptation to the human host. OK, you're, you're just breaking up a little there, but uh, I, I'm getting the gist of it. What, what does the data actually show us about these uh, variants? So the original B117 Kent variant seems to be more transmissible. Uh, there were some confounders in that, but it seems to be spreading more quickly throughout the UK population and also in other places like Australia, for example, uh, and, and perhaps Germany, where you've got some cases. The um, Bristol and Liverpool variants that have come on top of that uh, may well show some vaccine escape properties. Um, additional research on the original B117 Kent variant suggests uh, some perhaps some increased severity, but that hasn't been separated from the normal winter seasonal effects of um, enhanced um, mortality and morbidity due to pre-existing conditions like hypertension, diabetes, heart disease, etc. So there is still some um, uh, doubt about the um, true effect of that on clinical severity. Uh, also, the uh, original B117 variant, the Kent variant, uh, may have a wider spectrum of clinical symptoms compared to the previous circulating strain. Um, and it may well be that uh, it presents more, more with respiratory symptoms and less with things like loss of uh, taste and smell. But again, this is ongoing. The numbers still need to be uh, improved and increased before we can be definitive about this. And what about the effects of weather at the moment, the cold weather and hospitalizations <clears throat> as well? Yeah, so that's what I just mentioned. The seasonal winter cold may exacerbate a lot of the comorbidities that these patients present with and giving the impression that, you know, this variant is more severe at this time. So again, this is the Kent variant, the B117 variant. Uh, we, don't, we don't have enough data for the Liverpool and Bristol variants to make any comment like this. But the data, so from the B117 Kent variant, suggests more transmissibility and more severity of the illness, at least bringing hospital people to hospital. But once they're in hospital, there's no increase in mortality. And that, that relative increase in so-called severity is about 30 to 70 percent compared to what it was on the previous original Wuhan Chinese strain of the variant. But again, that's subject to indoor crowding during winter and enhanced mortality and morbidity uh, due to these pre-existing conditions during the colder winter months. So I think it's not entirely certain yet that this variant is really causing all those extra effects separate from the winter indoor crowding and the winter increased morbidity and mortality of those pre-existing conditions. Mm -hmm. And just really, really briefly, in which direction do you think SARS-CoV-2 is actually evolving now? Oh, I think we're seeing the virus is evolving to um, a more transmissible host adaptive strain with the E484K uh, and the additional uh, mutations we're seeing with the B117 variants as well as the South African and Brazilian variants. And the fact that these 484K, 501 and 417 mutations occurring independently across the world uh, in different variants from different countries suggests that this, these are the true uh, host adaptive uh, mutations that we're seeing now uh, to the human population. Julian Tang, thank you very much. Your questions now. Here's our science correspondent, Derek Williams. I've heard that like influenza, SARS-CoV-2 is destined to become endemic, even with widespread global vaccination. Is that true? This is another million dollar question that no one yet knows the answer to, but increasingly it appears to be yes. Um, to understand why, let's look at all the things that would have to happen to make the answer no instead. Um, in other words, what would it take to put the genie back in the bottle and eradicate COVID-19 completely? Um, well, as one WHO official put it, that's a, a very high bar. Several factors would play key roles in whether or not we could even hope to do it. Uh, one is the extent to which people are protected by A, natural infection, and B, vaccination. 
We now know that getting sick with COVID-19 provides a protective shield for at least half a year or so, but not a perfect one. Um, people can get reinfected after time has passed, which is, is not a surprise as that happens with other coronaviruses too. Um, assuming reinfected people also infect others, which is a pretty good bet, uh, you end up in the long run with a, a circular, fairly stable system of a certain number of people regularly passing it along to a certain number of others whose immunity has lapsed. Um, it's endemic. If vaccines can spur long-lasting immune responses and, and help prevent transmission, two things that we still don't really know yet, um, then it would give us a fighting chance of breaking the circle. But, but that would take moving fast with vaccination programs on a, on a really massive scale worldwide because we're also in a race against a mutating viral enemy with, with new variants arising all the time. And as long as large numbers of people remain unvaccinated, uh, wherever they are, they'll continue to provide a reservoir for the virus and, and also a space for it to evolve, potentially turning progress we've made so far into a, a, a two steps forward, one step back situation. Um, before I ruin your day though, please remember another important thing. Um, we can still end this pandemic, even if SARS-CoV-2 um, does become endemic. Um, all that means is that, that once we have the situation in hand to some extent, in the future, we'll have to react quickly to outbreaks um, with effective control measures. And, and we've been developing an arsenal of those for a year now. Derek could never ruin my day. Thanks for watching, stay safe, and I'll see you again very soon here on DW. Bye-bye.